So David and I are going to outline the potential challenges that breakthroughs in artificial intelligence might produce. And as Adriana mentioned, this talk is based on a discussion paper that we just recently finished. Uh, so one of the objectives of the Effective Altruism Foundation uh, is to provide discussion papers to stimulate public discourse and to explain our positions and our priorities to people who are interested. So far, we've completed um, this one discussion paper on the negative consequences of livestock production. This was um, in the context of the project Sentience Politics. Then we are currently in the pro process of um, writing a discussion paper on global poverty together with a think tank in working on Swiss foreign policy. And just recently we finished this discussion paper on AI and the risks and benefits of it. Uh, the press conference on this paper is probably going to be in October. So you guys are lucky and get to hear the content of it first. We had three main aims for this paper. One was uh, to give an accessible summary of our position on this topic and why we think uh, it is a priority from the standpoint of effective altruism. Then another aim was to establish connections to people working on AI or to computer scientists in general. So we're using this opportunity to send out emails to people, ask them for feedback or inputs and their support and hopefully um, some of this will prove fruitful down the line. And finally, we would like to establish uh, the Effective Altruism Foundation as uh, the place to go to for journalists if they, are, if they need a statement on some public issue in the media that has to do with AI and these risks. And so for the German-speaking area, we think it, it would be good if they would come to us. Uh, the introduction is now almost over already. Next. Uh, David is going to summarize the state of the art of AI and there's some quite impressive stuff that exists already and that presents uh, some challenges in how we deal with it and how we regulate new technologies. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the midterm social and economical risks um, that of the impact that AI and technological progress have on uh, the work landscape, mainly the point there is that jobs will be automated and that a lot of people might end up without work due to this progress. Uh, next, David is going to talk about the possibility of creating artificial superintelligence and how there are huge risks but also great opportunities associated with this. And finally, um, I'm going to explain why the matter might be very relevant for EA and what we can do to ensure a positive outcome of AI research. <coughs> okay, thanks Lucas. Um, yeah. Okay, so in this part I will just um, talk about yeah, currently employed narrow AIs or computer algorithms and their risks and opportunities. And with narrow AI I just mean an AI that is redesigned or is good at only one, in one domain, not um, and doesn't show intelligent behavior in, across many domains, just, such as humans do, for example. And yeah, I mean, although current narrow AI is uh, impressive, it's it's far from general showing general intelligence. So, one like our our daily life and our civilization in general is like increasingly governed by computer algorithms or narrow AIs, and um, for example, airplane traffic would dissolve into chaos without um, computer algorithms. And even like, yeah, the one sacred concept of love is getting computerized. For example, if you use online dating sites, for example, like the OkCupid, then matching algorithms can help you uh, finding a better mate. And as I will mention in the slide after the next, financial markets are also, also increasingly dependent upon algorithms. So one issue is that the uh, algorithms are getting more and more sophisticated and thereby our whole civilization is getting more and more complicated and uh, less understandable and generally the more complicated a system is the greater is the likelihood that some unexpected 
maybe even unforeseeable event uh, will occur that has catastrophic consequences, like events that the uh, author Nassim Taleb calls black swans. And one such, one such example is the flash crash, which occurred in May, 2000, <coughs> May 6, 2010. And here, many important stock market indexes collapsed and then recovered quite rapidly. And for example, like the Dow Jones, which is one of the most important um, and oldest stock market indexes in the whole world, lost in a few minutes over 9%. And yeah, you can see here a graphic. And <coughs> yeah, this amounted to the largest intraday loss in its history. And individual stocks fluctuated even much more, but yeah, I can't go into detail here. So there are several theories about what caused the flash crash, and I also can't uh, go into detail here, but basically almost all of them agree that automated trading activities executed by computer programs or so-called trading algorithms played like a huge and crucial role. And so it seems important to avoid future catastrophes, catastrophes but um, yeah, some may also argue, oh, it wasn't so bad with the flash crash. I mean, after a few minutes, everything went back to normal, comparatively speaking. But um, if we consider, yeah, what if, what if had happened if, um, for example, military AIs, let's say drones or autonomous weapon system had been involved, then probably, yeah, not everything would have been back to normal after a few minutes, um, because people would probably be dead. So, yeah. and so it seems seems to make sense to invest more into the understandability and re reliability and just general sa safety of algorithms. Um, but the problem is that. Um, yeah, most, most companies invest much more in making their algorithms more powerful just because yeah, of short-term economic in in incentives and they, comparatively speaking, neglect long-term safety considerations. Mm. So, of course, like narrow eyes or algorithms are not only bad and they have in improved our lives quite significantly and, yeah, and could do so even more in the future if they get better. And, yeah, uh, just... Two examples out of many that I could have mentioned is first the Google driverless car and as the name implies it was <laughs> developed by the company Google and yeah it doesn't need a human driver it can just drive by itself and to many of you may it may sound like yeah science fiction but actually such cars are yeah already reality for example over 20 of such cars um, have conducted sex successful road testing in many uh, US states and even yeah, in cities like in San Francisco without you know, killing people. So yeah. And there are many advantages to <coughs> driverless cars and but probably the most important one is their increased uh, safety. For example, in 2010 over 1.2 million people died in traffic accidents um, mostly due to human error and of course yeah, computerized driverless cars don't make human errors um, and they don't they also can't get tired or drunk <coughs> and yeah, they also have no cognitive biases like for example overconfidence or illusion of control that probably contribute to also a lot of um, traffic accidents. And another example is IBM's Watson and let's try. Uh, many of you probably notice this Watson or he, him um, and he won in 2011 against the best human players in the quiz show Jeopardy. And it's not just any old quiz show, it, it requires under the understanding of puns or sophisticated puns. So it's quite impressive that yeah, he managed to beat the best human players. Yeah, there we see him. And so, of course, like winning at quiz shows is impressive, but like, not hugely beneficial. But currently, this, this system is also used for medical purposes. For example, it makes and many US hospitals um, cancer diagnosis. And yeah, in several situations, actually, the Watson already outperforms human doctors. So it has the potential to really save a lot of human lives. So that's for this part. And now, next to Luca. As we just saw, um, computers are getting better at doing tasks that humans are doing. Um, so uh, in some time, people everywhere will be able to get their medical advice from programs like Watson. And it's going to be worth it for employers uh, 
to outsource work to qualified machines that can do the same thing cheaper and more efficiently. Uh, a study recently by the Future of, in, <coughs> Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford uh, suggests that up to 47% of jobs are at risk of being uh, computerized or automated and this is speaking of a time frame of 10 to 20 years. So you might wonder um, which jobs are safe. So the authors of this study suggest <laughs> that jobs that require a high level of social intelligence, creativity or dexterity, which in German is uh, fingerfertigkeit, those are the jobs that are the least likely to be uh, outsourced to machines anytime soon. So for instance, uh, if you're a PR advisor, that's something that we're going to need for quite some time to come. Or maybe an, an author or a game developer in terms of creativity or a medical surgeon. Um, but for most other jobs, the situation looks quite bleak. Uh, some notable economists think that we are already seeing uh, the first sign of this trend towards increased automation. <laughs> So this is a, a graph used by uh, the MIT economist Andrew McAfee. And here we see uh, four quantities and how they've uh, developed in the past. So both GDP, this uh, numbers here refer to the US, and also labor productivity. This refers to how many goods are produced by one hour of work. Both of these figures have been um, increasing steeply in the past and they were correlated and they were also <coughs> correlated with uh, the figures for private employment but recently private employment started to trail behind. Also medium household income uh, stagnated pretty much and currently it might even be the case that it's going downwards and McAfee explains this situation as follows. Uh, progress in technology make work more efficient, there are automated pro production cascades and this contributes to GDP going up, more wealth can be produced, but this situation makes it possible for a small number of skilled workers to use all the technologies available to produce all the goods to fulfill public demand. And so um, this, on the one hand, this is a good thing, uh, we can meet public demand, a lot of wealth is being produced, but the problem is that this increases social inequality because uh, for everyone who's not really needed to fulfill this demand, the wages go down and there might not be any jobs left. So the big challenge that we are already facing and that will just become bigger in the future is how all these benefits from better technologies uh, can be used to distribute all the gains to everyone. Uh, as of course we know, um, money and goods are more important in terms of people's well-being if the person is poor than if the person already has millions of dollars. And so uh, it makes sense to look into preventative measures, into options how uh, we could um, combat this social inequality somehow. And measures that have been proposed, one is to subsidize human work. So even if it would pay for an employer to, uh, uh, to employ a machine, to do it uh, for free, basically, um, maybe they should still pay humans to do it and they would get money from the government to have humans work there. Maybe this is a good thing, maybe humans need uh, something to do in order to be happy, even if it's ultimately a bit pointless. <laughs> but there are also other proposals, maybe, um, uh, there could be a basic <coughs> income for everyone, regardless whether people are working or not, or a negative income tax, which is essentially similar to the basic income. Uh, of course, this list isn't exhaustive. There might be other options to explore, and our recommendations uh, in the position paper is uh, to look at these forecasts that um, <coughs> governments should be doing this and judge whether these economists are onto something, and if yes, uh, it makes sense to start preparing and to study which sort of options would be good to uh, mitigate the negative impacts and make sure that everybody benefits from this increase in technology and wealth. Okay, thanks. Um, now we come to the 
yeah, long-term uh, future, the more speculative stuff, um, namely yeah, the prospect of superintelligence. And actually in the last two years especially, like more and more entrepreneurs and scientists have become worried about the prospects of superintelligent artificial intelligence. And for example, yeah, the famous entrepreneurs Elon Musk and Bill Gates and also Sam Harris and physicists like Max Tegmark and many more that I don't have time to name. And here's one quote by the famous physicist Stephen Hawking. The development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So, yeah, at first this, this quote might, might seem like yeah, technophobic um, fear-mongering, but yeah, maybe in the next 15 minutes we will see if it actually has substance. So, at first, like, we have to define what we actually mean or what I mean in, by intelligent in, intelligence in this talk, and I will just use the definition by the AI researchers Shane Leck and Markus Hutter, and here they went over over 70 different definitions of intelligence and just extracted the most common features that were common to all, basically all of those definitions. And they arrived at the following definition, intelligence measures an agent's ability to achieve its goals in a wide range of unknown environments. So you might ask yourself why we use exactly this kind of intelligence. Well, exactly this kind of intelligence is a big deal and what we should worry about. Because exactly this kind of intelligence, homo sapiens, or we humans, um, basically took over the planet Earth and dominated all other um, animals. Because we were just able to achieve our goals <coughs> in many environments, for example, by developing tools or like spears to hunt bigger animals or by inventing clothes um, to keep us warm in cold climates. And yeah, generally just humans were able to outsmarter faster and stronger animals. And yeah, it's important to keep in mind that this type of intelligence is, does not only refer to book smarts, it also includes common sense or for example social skills, because if you are able to win friends and be good in political disputes, then of course you are better able to achieve your goals. So in a sense, Intelligence, this kind of intelligence basically is power, then the power to optimize the world according to your preferences. So, then the next terminological question is what, what, what super intelligence actually means, and it's quite simple. Um, any agent is super intelligent that is just much more intelligent than the best or most smartest human in practically every field. Like, yeah, not only math and physics, but also in other stuff, like social skills, for example. <coughs> and, yeah, and what's important, like, a superintelligence doesn't necessarily have, necessarily have to be conscious. It can be just, like, a unsent non-sentient optimization process, for example. So, um, it's, superintelligence sounds pretty, sp like, pretty speculative stuff, but um, actually um, denying that that the possibility of superintelligence even exists um, as the burden of proof. Because there's just no reason to assume that the human level of intelligence is the, is the highest that, that could be there. It's actually, it's actually different, and here's a quote from Nick Bostrom in his book Superintelligence. It's actually more, more the case that we are probably better thought of as the stupidest possible species capable of starting a technological civilization, and it's a niche we filled not because we are in any sense optimally adapted to it, but just because we got first there. So yeah. Um, so many people, I think, could, could, be, could be convinced that superintelligence is p possible, but many of them just believe that it's more than, I don't know, 5,000 or 500 years away. So, but actually there has been a survey, or many surveys, of several groups of AI experts, and if you take them all together, then the majority of AI experts believes that with over 50% probability, human level artificial intelligence will be developed by the year 2050. So, <coughs> of course, this, this assumes that there yeah, is no, no global catastrophe uh, occurs that halts scientific progress or destroys civilization. And so, then we could also ask ourselves, okay, how long does it then take to achieve super intelligence? And again, in the same survey, um, the majority of AI experts also believe that once human-level AI is created, superintelligence is probably less than 30 years away. So, even if we assume that 
AI experts are biased just because of selection effects or because you know they just want to be uh, get more funding, whatever. Um, and keep in mind that those arguments could also be applied, for example, to climate scientists. Um, yeah, even if, uh, if we then downgrade their estimates, and I myself have wider confidence in intervals, it, it's, it still would seem severely um, overconfident to assume that there is a probability of less than 10% that superintelligence will be created in this century. And that's basically all we um, need to assume. Um. Um, so, okay, so you might be convinced that sure there's like, there's a probability that superintelligence AI will be created in this century, but it won't matter so much. Um, but actually, like, their <coughs> AIs could have a lot of advantages. At first, they would have several hardware advantages, and I will just um, mention here two. The first factor to consider is the differences in speed of their computational elements. Like a biological human, a uh, biological neuron, a human brain, just fires at a peak speed of around 200 times per second, whereas uh, modern microprocessors already operate at like 10 million times faster. And yeah, that's like a big difference. And also like there are big, could be huge differences in the amount of computational resources. For example, like the human brain only consists of 100 billion neurons, or like, it's a great number, but for example, it's not, it's not easily scalable. You can't just buy a new brain in the internet and just glue it to your forehead, for example. Whereas, um, yeah, AIs can be easily scaled, and supercomputers already have the size of warehouses. And yeah, here we see one. So, then there are also many, many software ad advantages of AIs, and I just used one. Um, for example, copyability. If, you, if you're a human, then you, you can't just copy your brain. But AIs can quite easily, if, if the hardware costs are not too high, can quite easily create thousands upon thousands of backups and copies and, for example, distrib distribute them all over the internet and then in many, many different servers, which almost makes them immortal, in, in a sense. So, yeah, and they would have yeah, many uh, many indentive copies with the same goal, so that would be hugely, uh, it would be much more powerful. Okay, so let, let's say we, we assume that, or we believe that the intelligence of AIs, and thereby their power of AIs, would be, would be, could be much greater than, than that of humans. We have to ask ourselves if this um, amounts then to the end of the predominance of, of Homo sapiens on this planet. Um, because, yeah, one example, yeah, AIs could just invent, for example, weapons which are as incomprehensible to us as, for example, nuclear bombs are to chimpanzees. And so, just as like we now currently dominate all other animals just because we just have the power to do so, AIs could dominate us um, if they want to. And, yeah, if they would only be half as bad as we, or if they would treat animals only half as bad as we, treat animals right now, then yeah, our future isn't exactly rosy. So, yeah, we have to, so basically the AIs would have the power to um, shape the future completely to, um, according to their values. So the most important question we can ask ourselves is what will their values be? And so some people assume, well, you know, they're super intelligent, so they will just be super nice <coughs> or super ethical. But um, yeah, it's actually, not the case, because intelligent doesn't automatically imply um, yeah, benevolence or altruism. For example, like just in humans you see that um, there are a lot of intelligent psychopaths. Yeah. And just in general, it's, it's very important not to anthropomorphize the, neither the capabilities, but especially not the goals or motivations of AIs. For example, most, most humans share, just because we are a biological species, that as com common ancestors, we share certain values like, for example, concern for status or empathy, more or less, towards others. And, but there's no reason why AIs um, should, should also have these values. Um, AIs could have completely alien values, like, for example, they could be, um, or very simple values. For example, there could be an AI that's super intelligent but has the only goal to compute as many digits of pi as possible. <laughs> And so, 
I hope I have to convince you like there are more arguments. Um, but anyway, just believe me. Like there's no you you can't predict the final goals of AIs, but um, the specific final goals. But we can predict the certain instrumental goals of AIs just because all sufficiently intelligent agents share certain instrumental goals because they are useful for achieving your final goals, whatever those <coughs> final goals are. And yeah, there are four of them. And the first one is self-preservation. And intelligent AI would want to preserve itself just because if it gets destroyed, then if it gets destroyed, then it can't achieve its, its goals anymore. Except, yeah, there's a copy or whatever. And then there's also the second instrumental goal of goal preservation. Any AI would want to preserve the content of its original final goals. Um, we could illustrate this by an example. Let's say someone offers you a pill that would turn you into a hedonist and would also make you or, or egoist, egoist but it would also make you much more happy. And let's say you are an effective altruist and you are not a hypocrite, then you wouldn't then you wouldn't take this, this pill, even if it would make you happier, just because you would lose your original goal of helping yeah, as many sentient beings as possible. Yeah, provided you are not a hypocrite. But yeah. And then there's also the third um, instrumental goal of self-improvement, and AI would just want to improve its own intelligence because that just means it has then a greater ability to achieve its goals. And it would also try to acquire as many resources as possible just because re resources are always useful for achieving your final or instrumental goals. And so this was a very abstract discussion, but if you internalize all, the, all these um, arguments, you could see that basically doom could be the default outcome because, yeah, let, let's just illustrate it with one one specific or concrete example, and it's like this example is just like, yeah, you only use it for illustrative purposes. It's like, I don't predict this, and it's very unlikely in itself, and yeah, there's many flaws, but let's just assume, you know, at the end of the century, there's a tension increases, maybe of, because of climate change, whatever, and there's a war <coughs> going on between China and the USA and maybe Russia. And so, some, the CIA has this really nice, um, excellent idea of building a, a super intelligent AI that the sole goal of preventing nuclear war. So let's assume that this AI, just because yeah, it increased its own intelligence recursively and it just developed completely new technologies and it hacked into financial in institutions and it just got large amounts of financial resources. It convinced several people or humans to help the AI just because it has also excellent social and manipulation skills and yeah, it's built like factories all over the um, all over the world, and I don't know some desert to build its yeah armies there. <laughs> Let's just assume that it has the capability to take over the world completely. So, how do you, if you're the AI, how do you optimally or most effectively achieve your goal of preventing nuclear war? So, we probably think, oh yeah, we could just maybe it just can build a shield, you know, like that's, that's perfectly defense against nuclear war, nuclear weapons, but. Yeah, no, maybe someone wants to disable the shield or whatever. Or it could maybe some more radical solution would be just destroy China and Russia so they can't fire um, nuclear weapons anymore. But then they might other, other nations might develop nuclear weapons. So actually the optimal solution would be just to exterminate humanity and of course also all other life forms just because yeah, other life forms might, um, evolution con continues, also get intelligent and, and discover um, nuclear weapons. So, yeah, basically, and you can make similar scenarios with almost any final goal, and it's just the case that, yeah, almost any final goal would lead to our extinction and also subsequent space colonization on part of the AI. So, the problem is just that unless you specifically program the AI to preserve what humans value, it will just destroy everything we value incidentally, or for instrumental reasons. It's important to keep in mind that the AI doesn't, doesn't hate us or doesn't... doesn't love us, whatever, it doesn't feel any emotion towards us, but we are just, first of all, we are made of atoms, which it can just use as resources for achieving its goals, and yeah, we also have different goals, and we are also intelligent agents, and we would, 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 we would yeah, 
like to not, um, for example, exterminate humanity. So it perceives us as a as a competitor. So and also like yeah, it could be much worse because it also could create enormous amounts of suffering or astronomical amounts of suffering just if it um, helps to achieve its goals, just by a very, very tiny amount. And yeah, because it just wouldn't care at all about suffering, except we somehow yeah, program into it to value uh, reducing the reduction of suffering. So yeah, that basically brings us to the next point. So why, why don't we just equip the AI with nice goals, like with friendly goals? Why, yeah, I mean, nobody wants to make a super intelligent paper clip, for example. So, I mean, yeah, that seems pretty like a very good idea, but the problem is that it's, it's pretty hard to um, program into an AI um, desirable values, and this <coughs> has been called the value loading problem in the, in the literature. And yeah, one aspect is, of this problem is that it's just very hard to express com complex concepts or values, like for example, preserving human autonomy or reducing suffering in, in a programming language, and yeah, just transfer this into the AI. And also we have to keep in mind that we have to be very careful what we wish for. And if we just try to you know, program into the AI an approximation of what we mean, then it will just go with the literal meaning of the goal we program into it. Because it has no reason, even if it completely understands that the human pro the programmers who built the AI had something completely different in mind, there's no reason for it to, to pick the intended meaning instead of the literal meaning. Except we program somehow into it, okay, we are not so good at programming, can you please pick the intended meaning instead of the literal one? But how do you program this in programming language? That's pretty hard. And Okay, even if we assume that we somehow uh, solve the value loading problem, there might be a potentially even bigger problem, namely, which values should we choose? And if you just look at the moral track record of humanity, um, it does, this doesn't exactly inspire confidence, because, yeah, until very re recently, the, almost all humans basically were uh, racist and sexist and nationalist, nationalistic, and, yeah, so, it might be the case, even if you think you yourself are an enlightened, you know, anti-speciesist and non-sexist and non-racist, there might be still something that we miss and that future generations, um, future gen generations might look back on our behavior and think these were really cruel people. Um, so, yeah, it's, there have been proposed some solutions, for example, coherent extrapolated volition. Um, <coughs> And which is, yeah, it seems like a very um, promising approach. And also it would be very useful to, for example, yeah, establish cooperation between different value systems. Just because, yeah, agreement extrapolation related volition just means don't program your actual preferences into the AI, but just um, program into it the values that you would have if you thought more about all the arguments, read more of the books you should read in moral philosophy, talked more with the people you don't know yet, and just became friends with people from other nations or other value systems and then program these values into the, into the eye because they might be, you know, just program yourself, um, your enlightened self kind of in, in, into this AI. And yeah, this is also um, very promising because it, yeah, it not only could potentially every, every party on, on earth agree, for example, like yeah, a deontological Christian and a utilitarian atheist, but it also it seems like, for game theoretic reasons, uh, a good solution because, yeah, we could just all cooperate towards this goal. And, yeah, there seem, seem little other goals that we all could work towards and could get behind. So, um, to give a short summary on why the points that we made so far speak in favor of AI being relevant for effective altruists, First, um, if we look at crowdedness, um, there, there are actually a lot of people who work on creating AI, but only very few people who work on making sure that the outcome will be positive, that uh, these things will be safe in terms of long-term global risks. So in this sense, um, it seems that things speak strongly in favor of this being important. Also, if we compare it with something like 
and climate change. Of course, it would be better if even more people cared about preventing climate change. But in comparison, there are probably hundreds of times as many people who care about climate change and are doing something about it than there are people who worry about AI. And arguably, uh, the risks from AI are bigger because even very bad forecasts of climate change would still have some humans uh, surviving. Whereas with AI, um, there is just one shot, and if we mess up, then the outcome could end up very bad. Um, so yeah, this, this speaks in favor of this. Then scopes. Arguably, the stakes couldn't be higher because AI is the last stage of technology. Once you have AI, you can use it to invent all sorts of other technologies. And this just makes this a very important lever that you would want to influence if you want to influence the long-term future of life on Earth. And finally, uh, tractability. Now, this is uh, where things are less clear. Clit critics argue that um, AI is too difficult to influence because it's a novel topic, it's hard to predict. There are no uh, case studies so far how we would uh, effective, affect it positively. And that's certainly a, a point to make, but I would say that unless we've really tried for quite a long time and give it our best to figure out ways how we could influence it, uh, it seems like it would be overconfident to just say that there is no way we can make a difference. Um, and I want to go back to the point about the stakes couldn't be higher. So the general theme here is that technological progress increases the stakes that we are playing for. So if we compare, uh, look back to the Stone Age, if people fought back then, you hit the other guy over the head with the club, uh, this is bad, this creates some suffering, um, but the matter is very contained. Whereas uh, with modern warfare, with uh, nuclear bombs, and if something goes bad, it goes bad for a lot of people, maybe also for future generations, and there's just so much more that is at stake. And the main culprit here is that technology gives us a bigger causal reach. If we look back in history, our values improved a lot. So there was this practice in the Middle Ages that Steven Pinker describes in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Um, it's called medieval cat burning. So people threw cats into the bonfire for public amusement. And Pinker describes that the cats shrieked with laughter as the animals howling with pain were singed, roasted, and finally carbonized. And this wasn't something that a few deranged individuals were doing. This was done habitually, sometimes just for public amusement. And comparison to that, our values uh, have improved greatly. So we have anti-cruelty laws. People believe that animals at least deserve some protection. Uh, a lot of people, in fact, believe that animals deserve more than that, that they, we believe that they uh, deserve moral rights. So it seems that the situation should have improved a great deal for non-human non animals. Shit. <coughs> Um, the problem is uh, we are currently causing more direct harm to animals than ever before in history. Our values did improve, but so did our causal reach. And it's now just because of population growth and because um, we now have the technology to very cheaply mass produce uh, animal products at these large scales and people don't care sufficiently much that uh, the direct suffering caused to animals increased. So this is an instance where technological progress uh, poses a risk um, if it doesn't come with sufficient safety precautions, precautions and with good enough values. And the same point can be applied to AI, uh, where we also have uh, a huge increase to the stakes. So AI might... Uh, come with space colonization <coughs> and the possibility to also multiply the number of sentient beings by a large number. And also it might be possible to simulate conscious beings uh, on a digital medium, artificial consciousness. And those are very big challenges. And the question is, uh, 
um, are we ready and what can we do to get ready to also uh, realize all the possible upside of this technology. Uh, so actually the problem can be both. It's uh, bad values or not being wise enough that you actually do the thing that you want. So uh, AI might lead to bad outcomes because some humans have bad moral values that they might implement. So it would be very nice if effective altruists could influence the goals of an AI, but maybe it might also be some secret military project or government of China, who's currently not very good even on, in regard to human rights. And this will be a challenge that we make sure that uh, positive moral values will be implemented. And then there's also a risk that just some random value gets implemented because value loading is difficult and uh, researchers might mess up. And that is also bad because it would lead to bad outcomes where presumably humans go extinct. And also if the AI has no concern for suffering, it's extremely risky. It might, um, in order to accumulate resources, the AI might still end up colonizing space just to fulfill some random goal like preventing nuclear war. Um, and it might create a fleet of sentient robots to turn planets into resources. This might suffer, it might uh, cause suffering through other means. Uh, cr creates programs of super scientists that are enslaved to do research, maybe run simulations of evolution with wild animal suffering just to figure out how probable it is that there are aliens, uh, that life evolved somewhere else. I mean, this would be relevant information to know if you plan on colonizing space. And so the point isn't that any of these uh, scenarios are likely to happen. The point is more that without concern for suffering, we have no idea what's going to happen. And th there are some scenarios that are we're thinking about that would be extremely bad. And likewise also, if there is suffering elsewhere in the universe that could be reduced, the AI simply won't care. And if anything, it might even increase it unless it has very specific, uh, very positive moral values. So again, superintelligence <coughs> is the last stage of technology and therefore it's important that our own moral progress and also practical safety pr precautions that we take uh, are maximal as well before we actually go on to create this dangerous technology. So very briefly a point about rational risk management. If the stakes are very high, basically uh, AI could also solve all of the world's pro problems and create a really good outcome, so it's definitely something important. Um, even if the probability is low that the scenario work out the ways that we intend, many experts think that superintelligence is possible. What's less clear is how we can affect it positively, but even if that probability is quite low, uh, it might still make sense to invest resources into this particular topic. And so if we assume that we want to work on ensuring positive AI outcomes, what can we do? One thing is to start by informing policymakers, scientists and the general public. This way you get more people on board with this cause. And yeah, you just increase the movement of people who care about it. And then there's one important concept called differential technological de development. You want to fund research that is specifically on making AI safe and it would be good if there is a way to pull resources <coughs> away from the general AI research, which is progressing at a rapid speed, but without enough resources being put into safety. So for instance, if there are, is an organization that gives out grants to AI research, it would be really good if we conv could convince this organization to give out grants to specific research that thinks about how can we make this technology safe. And then there's general strategic analysis, thinking about other options in which we could have a positive impact, thinking outside the box, maybe we are missing something, maybe also it's important to work on value spreading, on human values, to make sure that whoever creates AI eventually, that these people will have good intentions. And finally, uh, it could make sense to increase political cooperation uh, for instance, think of CERN in Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider. This is a huge inter uh, international project where 
many nations contribute funds towards it. If something like this were to happen with AI research, this would be ideal because arms races are a big problem. There are uh, economic, maybe also military incentives to build AI first and countries compete for that. But if they all work together, then there would be no reason to hurry and there would be a reason to prioritize safety over speed. So who's working on these uh, AI-related issues? The Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford that I already mentioned before is doing general strategic research and also outreach to the public. Nick Bostrom works there who wrote the book Superintelligence. Then there's the Machine Intelligence Research Institute in California. Uh, they work on the te technical aspect of things. They do a lot of math-related research on how to program good goals into AI and how to make it provenly safe. And the Foundational Research Institute that is affiliated with the Effective Altruism Foundation, uh, we focus on <coughs> dystopian scenarios, on very bad AI-related outcomes, and on the best ways of preventing them. Uh, yeah, that, that was it. Um, one more thing. Uh, we printed some versions of the position paper for those who speak German, but uh, they didn't make it here, they're still at the office, but I can bring them tomorrow, so if people are interested, feel free to approach me, and in the upcoming break, you can also ask questions to David and me, and yeah, also Cosper has also uh, given a lot of presentations on AI, you can also ask him questions, he's also an expert on this topic. Thanks.